that the mother bore this child. She carried this, she conceived this child. Wahanan ala wahani. Allah now says, wa fisaluhu fi amin. Weakness upon hardship. Weakness upon hardship. Wa fisaluhu fi amin. But the end of it all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this child was weaned after three, after two complete years. If you should look at this particular verse, fill on this particular verse of the Holy Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us to understand that there are three stages that we need to understand. These three stages are as follows. One, alhamdulu, pregnancy. Two, al breastfeeding. Three, al wadu child birth. The concept of pregnancy, the concept of breastfeeding, and the concept of child birth. So you, these three concepts, you extract it from this part of this particular verse, whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hamalatu ummu wahana. That is, the child was weaned after two years. But these two years has not been easy for the mother. Because Allah says, She toiled. She, she endured just for the survival of this child. So, the endurance and the toil and the experience of weakness and hardship that the mother faced. You, you have to reflect on these things from these three perspectives. The period of pregnancy has not always been easy for women. Then breastfeeding. You will see that even medically, it is being encouraged that the first stage of development of the child the child should be given enough breast because this goes a long way to give the child, the infant, a kind of special kind of growth. So, but at times, women do not find it easy. If not those that appreciate what has been said, or if not for those that stick to the advice of medical practitioners, the women always want to look for a substitute to breastfeed it. They don't want to, they don't want it to take place for a long time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Holy Quran, He said, that that the breastfeeding mother that is breastfeeding her child, Yurbina Aulada Hun, they have been permitted, they have been encouraged to breastfeed their children. Haulaini kamilei for two complete years. Haulaini kamilei for two complete years. That will be 24 months. Liman arada and yutima arada. But for the breast breastfeeding to be of two years, it's not compulsory that it must be two years. Allah says, Liman arada for those that wish, that want to perfect the duration of this breastfeeding. So what I want us to understand is, based on this particular verse, the experience has not been easy. What experience was not easy? These three particular stages. The pregnancy, the breastfeeding, and at the same time, the day, the day of childbirth itself, when the woman was in labor before the child was put to bed. That is why, technically, women have been compensated. Naturally, in Islam, women have been compensated because of this particular experience they have, on, they have experienced, they have undergone, they have been compensated. How have they been compensated? The Prophet wasallam told us that there was a time someone came to the Prophet to ask him a particular question. Among my two parents, who deserves the right most that I should do good to? The Prophet said, 
Umuka Yomoda. The questioner now repeated, I have heard the old prophet of Allah. After my mother, then who again? The prophet said, your mother. Then the questioner who was asking the prophet وسلم, repeated the question three times. Then who again? Summa mani ya Rasulullah. Then who again, O Prophet of Allah? The Prophet now said, Your mother. So, my brothers and sisters in Islam, my audience, all those of us that are on ground listening to this breakdown, if I ask a technical question, our sister gave us Ramadan challenge. And this is also another challenge, but it, I've already given us the answer that. The Prophet وسلم, mentioned your mother, your mother, your mother. How many times the Prophet mentioned your mother to this particular companion? Three times. Now let us go back to that verse of the Holy Quran. Allah says, Hamalatu umuhu wahanan ala wahani wa fi saluhu fi amay. The mother, she feared this child, weakness upon hardship, and at the end of it all, the child was weaned within the duration of two years. I told us that this particular duration of two years, there are three stages. The first stage is the child birth, labor, alwadu. This, but before labor, you have hamlu, that is pregnancy. You have wadu, then you have a rebel. So which means your mother, the first one, the first one is for the pregnancy. Your mother, the second one, is to compensate for the labor. Your mother, the third one, is to compensate for the breastfeeding. What was saying that in San, the Wali Deji, Amalatu, Omubu, Wahan, and Allah Wahani, Wafi Salu, who be a main, Anish Kuruli, Wali Wali Deji. So when the questioner now asked, he now asked the fourth time, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now said, Summa Abuka. Do good to your mother three times. So the ratio is ratio three over four for the mother. And the father is ratio one over four. So that is Islam for you. So these are some of those things we derive from this particular verse of the Holy Quran. What was saying that in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after this particular experience, this is the status of your parents. You should appreciate me. You give thanks to me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wali walidayk. Then at the same time, you must not forget your parents. They, do, they deserve to be appreciated, irrespective of whatever status or caliber. They are up. And there's another technical point I also want to drive home. Still on this particular verse of the Holy Quran, there are some children, maybe because of a particular kind of experience they experienced when they were small. Some will say that when I was small as a child, I never knew my dad. When I was small as a child, my dad was not responsible for my upkeep. My dad was not responsible for sponsoring my education. I cannot even count, nor can I say what has been the contribution of my dad to my upkeep, to my upbringing, to my development in life, to my success, to my success in life. Maybe because by, by chance or by circumstance, the two parents are divorced and the child grew up at the end of the mother. So he never was opportune to benefit any goodness from his dad. So you have some that will now grow with hatred for that particular kind of parent. So the question is, because of that experience that child has experienced, is that, is that hatred? Is it justified Islamically? The answer is not far-fetched. The answer is no. It is not justified Islamically. 
Because if you should still on this verse, the answer is being brought from this verse. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anishkurni wali walide. You appreciate me and you appreciate your parents. The essence of appreciating your parents, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it besides appreciating Allah. Why do you really have to appreciate Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator. He is your sustainer. And he has done a lot for you. But it has been through your parents that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought you into existence. So that fact alone makes you know that they deserve to be appreciated. We were saying that in Zan, the Wali Dei, Amalatu Umubu, Wahanan Ala Wahani, Wafisadu who be Amaini, and is poorly Wali Wali Dei. Fill on this verse of the Holy Quran. Another technical point we have derived from this particular verse of the Holy Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has time for a lot of things. If you should look at this verse here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about two years. And in two years, we have how many months? We have 24 months in two years. We have 24 months in two years. If you now go to the Quran, you go and look at Quran chapter 46, Surah al ahaqaf verse 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that particular verse, he said, وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانُ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحِسَانًا Similar to that of Surah al luqman that we are working on. Allah says, وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانُ we have also commanded man. The kind of command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in Surah Al-Luqman is being repeated here in Surah Al-Ahaqaf, Quran chapter 46. But there is a difference in the presentation of Allah here. Allah says, Hamalatu umuhu Qur'an, his mother, beard, his load, his pregnancy, with hardship, and when she gave birth to the child, it was with hardship, it was not easy. Allah now says, Allah now combined the two. He said, the duration for the pregnancy and the duration for breastfeeding and winning of the child all amounts to 30 months. All amounts to 30 months. Talakuna shaharan. Allah says 30 months. So in Surah Al Ahaqaf here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has combined everything the period of pregnancy, the period of breastfeeding, and the stage the child would reach that the child will have his or her own freedom that he has been weaned by the mom. Everything is being calculated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be. Summarized under 30 months. In the verse of Surah Al Luqman, which is our point of preference, Allah says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, Amalatu umuhu wahanan ala wahani wa fisalu bi amain. That Allah, that He was weaned after two years. Two years, you have 24 months. So technically, if you should look at these two particular verses of the Holy Quran, Scholars have been brought forth some technicalities. The technicalities are as follows. They said, The minimum duration for pregnancy is six months. Yes, the minimum duration of pregnancy is six months. If by chance a brother goes into wedlock with a sister, they do their nikah and they get married. After six months, she puts to bed. After six months, she puts to bed. What we are used to, what we all know is that pregnancy is always of an average of nine months. But after six months, she puts to bed. My brother, do not be afraid. Because some might be afraid. Ah, six months. Oh, she never. 
abo konyu wasi no lemi. No. So based on these two particular verses of the Holy Quran, so one technicality that we have brought forth is the minimum duration for pregnancy Islamically. I don't know what doctors might be saying. Islamically, it starts from six. Pregnancy could be six months, it could be seven months, it could be eight months, it could be nine months, which is the average. It could extend beyond the nine, it could be 10, it could be 11, it could be 12 months, it could exceed a year. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fa'alun lima yuri. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does his things, he performs wonders, he does his things the way he wishes. And nobody will question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where, how did we derive our six months? It's simple mathematics. In Surah Al-Luqman, Amen, two years is 24 months. In Surah Al-Ahakaf, he said, Falakuna Shaharan. He said, 30 months. 30 minus 24. I think we are already getting the answer. 30 minus 24 will give us what? Six. So that is where scholars of Islam have brought forth that if you get married to a woman and she puts to bed after six months, that child is your child, Islamically. Except you have some other evidences to prove that that woman has become pregnant before you now married her. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to remind us, wa wasayna al-insana bi walidayhi hamalatuhu ummuhu wahanan ala wahanin wa fisaluhu fi amayni anishkuru li wali walidayhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you should give thanks to me, you should appreciate me, and at the same time, you should appreciate your parents. Ashukru lillah. We have to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to appreciate Allah ala ni'matul iman. The first reason why we have to appreciate Allah is because Allah has made us Muslim. Iman. For the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has counted us to be among, among the, those that have believed. Ah, we need to give thanks to Allah. Alhamdulillah. Then you also have a lot of bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to us, that you cannot even count it, you cannot give limits to it. So that is why we must always give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why then should we appreciate parents? I have told us that we have to appreciate our parents because one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used them as our means of coming to this life. Then secondly, added value to that means are a lot of things, a lot of responsibilities that parents execute upon their children. That is why one of the early Muslims named Sufyan bin Oyena said, Man salawatul khams. Anybody that observes the five daily prayers of the Shaykh of Allah Ta'ala, verily, such a person really has appreciated Allah. Anybody that finds himself in the path of Allah and he all is constant in observing his salat, five daily prayers, we should, that person should know that it is a sign that he really appreciates Allah for what he has done for him. And anybody that now supplicates just make prayer for his parents after he has performed his salat. Surely that person is also showing gratitude to his parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa wa sayin al-insan bi walidayhi hamalatuhu ummuhu wahanan ala wahanin wa fisaluhu fi amayn anishkur li wa li walidayka ilayya al-masih. Allah says, Verily, you should appreciate me, and at the same time, you should appreciate your parents. And surely, wali wali deika ilayal masil, because you are all coming back to me. After all said and done, there are some other things we also need 
to reflect upon or we need to understand. And scholars have categorized these things under a double burial holiday. That is the etiquette of doing good to parents. So we need to understand what are the etiquettes of doing good to parents. The etiquette of doing good to parents have been summarized under the following points. Point number one. مخاطبت الوالدين في الفاظ الاحترام والتوكيد. Whenever you are exchanging words with your parents, when you are talking to them, they are talking to you. You are responding. So the way you respond to your parents should be the الفاظ الاحترام والتوكيد. Your choice of words should show respect. Your choice of words should show respect that yes. I'm really talking with my dad. I'm really discussing or talking with my mom. Al-Ihitiram wa tawkid. You should show respect to them. Ma hafzu sawt wal istima' lahum. And your voice should not rise above this. Your voice should not rise above this. And when your parents are talking, you do not cut them short. You allow them Whatever they are going to say, even if it, if it makes meaning, you keep quiet and listen to them. Now, this is part of what was saying al insan diwali It's part of the etiquette that we need to understand that this, while conversing with them, while exchanging words with them, it should be the alphas and ihtiram what okay. Your choice of words. You don't use the kind of words you use for your wife in your house. You don't use the kind of word you will use for your kid in the house. When it comes to your dad or your mom, your choice of words should be selective. And the kind of choice of word you have to make must show respect and value for that particular kind of parent irrespective of your own status irrespective of your own status as the child irrespective of your rank in the environment when it comes to discussing with your dad or your mom if he or she is talking you allow him he or she to learn you don't cut them short when they are talking that is one two adam and another elaine you don't look into the two eyes of your dad or your mom it's a sign of disrespect. When you are sitting together or when there's a particular incident that has to bring both of you together, you don't look directly into the eyes of your dad or your mom. You have to show respect. You lower your gaze while being in their company. So that is also part of respect. What was saying that in San it is still under the, the message of this particular verse in Surah al -Luqman. Point number three. If by chance you are working together, you have to reach a particular place, maybe from your house. You want to move to the masjid with your dad. Yes, you want to move to the masjid with your dad. So a part of the ethics of doing good to parents is Adam al mashi amamahu. You should not go, you should not walk in front of them. Your dad will be in front, you'll be behind. So that is part of the ethics of relating with parents. It's not that you will be in their front and they will be behind, except if they have permitted you. If otherwise, it is your dad that will be in the front, you stay at the back. It is your mom that will be in the front, you stay at the back. Point number four. You always say the tasleem to your parents whenever you come in contact with them. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one of his numerous traditions has advised us on three things. What are these three things? The Prophet said, Thus, issue salamu bainakum. Issue salamu bainakum. 
وطعيم الطعام وصلوا بالليل والناس نيا تدخل الجنة ربكم بالسلام The prophet has said if you salam obey no spread the greetings of peace taslim salam spread it amongst yourself if you salam obey no the dad to say taslim to members of his household the members of the household to say taslim to the dad the mom to say taslim to members of her household the members of the household to say taslim to their mom but when it comes to father child relationship mother daughter relationship in the duhur when you come into their apartment you stay to sleep assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah when you go out stay to sleep so these are some of the attributes that you see in a child you know that this child has the upbringing good upbringing and the training of an islam is part of the ethics that is attached to the message in this verse in surah al-luqman verse 14 wa wasayna al-insan bi walidayhi ihsan point number 5 adam al-bad al-ta'am aw al-sharab qabla huma if by chance you have to sit on the same table to eat together if you have to sit on the same table to eat together you don't start eating before they have started Eba jojo kupo te jobe je. Ba be o koko bere si ma je uno ki wo to towo bonu abo. Mo mi e o koko bere si ma je uno o to towo bonu abo. Ti o ba wa siwaju won towo bonu abo o leko. Da da Tolorun wa pa se ninu suratul Luqman ya verse 14. Wa wa sayna al-insanu bi walidayhi ihsanan. So you have gone against that. So that is point number 5. Point number 6. Addu a'u lahuma mal izhar al-wut you should always pray for them you should not wait till your parents pass on before you pray for them this is another mistake some people are making they wait for the demise of their parents before they think it right to supplicate or to pray for their parents even when they are alive you pray for them when they discharge any responsibility just by the fact that it is their responsibility you appreciate them jazakumullahu khairan if your dad gives you anything jazakumullahu khairan if your mom gives you anything jazakumullahu khairan she buys for you she pays your school fees jazakumullahu khairan you appreciate them in their absence not when they are gone in their absence you are not with them you always remind you remember how they've been doing good to you you continue to pray for them if this has been your attitude when they were alive definitely definitely technically when they are no more alive they deserve your prayers more than even when they were alive then if by chance they fall sick mulazamatuhuma in the mar this is point 7 if by chance they fall sick mulazamatuhum in the marad wal qiyam bi haqqihi ma alay you have to move very close to them that is it you give them all the care they need at that particular time you give them all the care they need at that particular time this also is part of the etiquette until in that particular verse wa wasayna al insan bi walidayhi ihsan but at times there are some other things we have noticed most especially it is very rampant among we the yorubas here i can't say those of us that are abroad there but definitely i know most of us we are not there with our parents you are only there with your wife and your kids where is your daddy where is your mom these are questions you need to answer but those of us that are here maybe some of us are staying at lagos for example and the dad or the mom is staying at ocean the dad or the mom is staying at kwara so some things do happen at times those of us that are fathers those of us that are males that are already married so there are some particular instances whereby our parents will need our companionship that we need to move close to them maybe because of their sickness or some other things some of us will just send some people even some of us do send our wives the family's lot of money 
daddy. So whenever you do this, don't forget that your it is your responsibility. And you are running away from that responsibility. You are letting your wife carry that burden. I call it a burden because it is not her own responsibility. But don't worry. If she does it on your behalf, I do it on your behalf. So these are things you need to understand. What was saying that in San, the Wali Deiki, Ehesan. We are still on that bus. This Ehesan, Ehesan, Ehesan. That's why I said, the first lecturer that discussed this topic in Yoruba, he has said a lot of things. But don't forget that Al Quran, Allah. Al Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You continue to double into it, you continue to double into it, and never will you be able to exhaust the content of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, point number eight, and nafaqa alayhima. And nafaqa alayhima. If at a point in time, you now reach a particular stage whereby they become old, so they need you to sustain them. So you have to understand that your sustaining them is a compulsory necessity. Walhaju wal i'timar an huma in ajaza an dhalik. And if by chance they've not been opportune to go to Hajj or Umrah, then it's part of an ihsan, doing good to your parents, to go to Hajj or Umrah on their behalf. That is after their demise, when they are passed on. So it's part of those things you need to plan for. Allah Akbar. You just think, ah, my dad was not able, was not able to meet up with Hajj. Inshallah, after my own. The next hajj will be for my dad. My mom was not able to meet up with her. Inshallah, after my own, the next hajj will be for my mom. So these are things we need to understand. Then, among the etiquettes that we also need to understand, before that, let me bring a particular hadith narrated by Abu Huraira, Radhi Allahu anhu. He said, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسُ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Abu Huraira said that we were seated, we sat around the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم at a particular day. He صَلَى عَلَيْنَا شَابٌ مِنَ الْفَنِيَةِ Then a very young chap came towards us. He was coming from the direction of the valley in Medina. فَلَمَّا رَأَيْنَاهُ بِأَبْصَارِنَا قُلْنَا Abu Huraira now said, when we now saw him coming, we now said, Had it been, ah, look at how, how this chap looks very strong and agile. How will it be? If he uses his strength, his stamina, and his intellect, he uses it in the path of Allah. So this was the discussion of the companions amongst themselves. So the prophet now overheard them. He now said, What do you mean by using it in the path of Allah? Don't you understand that? The person that you will really ascertain that he has struggled in the path of Allah is that person that went to the battlefield and he was killed. He died there. The Prophet said, Man sa'a ala wali Anybody that spends his time, that spends his time taking care of his parents, is also in the path of Allah. Woman sa'a. Anybody that spends his time taking care of his family is also in the path of Allah. Anybody that spends his time for himself seeking for one thing or the other is in the path of Allah. But anybody that strives so that he will amass wealth 
so that he also would be among the first class millionaires in the environment. The prophet said, For who of these said he's a shaitan? That one is in the path of a shaitan, it's not in the path of Allah. Point number nine. We were saying that the insan will be wali day he a hisan. We are still on that particular verse. Adam will suffer, I will jihad, Kabla Ibn Umar. You should not travel or you go to the battlefield without the permission of your parents. Then the last point, which is going to be point number 10. As-salatu alayhima ba'da mawtihima wa dafnihima. If by chance the parents pass on before their child, then you pray for them. That is the first aspect of your prayer is the salat al janai the funeral prayer. Then after that, you continue to pray for them whenever you remember them and you remember the good they've done for you. But don't forget that the way we have started is that you should go do good to your parents even if they are non-Muslim. So if you have been doing good to your parents that are non-Muslim, by the time they pass on, you know that the issue of praying for them has a restriction. So these are some of those things we need to understand. So inshallah, with what I've said briefly, I think I want to round up here so far so good so that I give us time probably there might be one or two questions we want to ask. So the summary of it all is we have technically studied the content of that particular verse in Suratul Luqman. We were saying that in San Biwali Jayi, Hamalatu Umuhu Wahan and Allah Wahani, Wafisal Hufi Ameini, and his Burli Waliwali Jayka Ilayal Masih. A full of Holy Hada, Astaf Kirullah Ali Walakum, Assalamu Alaikum, Warahmatullahi, Wabarakatu. Waalaikum Salam, Warahmatullahi, Wabarakatu. Jazakumullahu khairan kathiran ya shaykh. Uh, we, in fact, you really touch all the aspects that you need to touch in this uh, verse. We pray to Almighty Allah to continue to increase you in knowledge and Islamic understanding, inshallah. We appreciate you so much. Jazakumullahu khairan ya shaykh. Uh, wow. In fact, I don't even know where to start from. But we have uh, some question here that I will want you to uh, answer before you leave. Uh, the number one question is, uh, what are your suggestions for those who their parents died young to hand the same reward to taking care of their parents? Um, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen. I want to get you right. Is it when the child was young that the parents died? Or no. No, when the when the parents when the uh, when the child is still growing up and the parent died in that process. Okay. And well, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alami, as at the time the parents passed on, so he or she was still a child, so he has not yet gotten the opportunity to do a lot of things for them. I think that is what you are trying to say. So yes, sir. That is the if that is the case, so there are some things we need to understand that goodness to parents, doing good to parents is not restricted to when they are alive alone. Doing good to parents is not restricted to when they are alive alone. Even after they had passed on, goodness to parents still continues. How? The form of goodness we have to do to them after they are Jemites, most especially if they are Muslim, we continue to pray for them. Two, if either of the two parents have not yet gone for Hajj, so the child should try to go on their behalf. Three, the members of the family of that particular parent, that is, if it is the dad, maybe he has some siblings that are still alive, so he should relate with those siblings of his dad as if he's relating with his dad. Likewise, if it is the mom that passed on when he was still a child, but now he has grown up and he's not happy that he has not been able to do much to his parents, he should look for members of 
the family of the parents to continue to do good. So doing good to them is as if he is doing it to his parents directly. Apart from that, if they have friends, we get information that they have close associates. So we move close to those friends and make sure that those friends will still feel the presence of our parents. So the summary of it all is doing good to parents does, does not end after the damage. It still continues. It just depends on how we go about it. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, the second question is, uh, you you taught us about the child about children is not Islamic to be looking uh, straight to your parents' eyes and trying to express yourself and trying to you, you should lower your gaze uh, you you should, yes, yes. when you are trying to talk to your parent. No. But in U.S., that is a sign of a, uh, a child is lying or is is hiding something. If you are not looking. Uh, straight to somebody's face, that means you are lying or you are trying to hide something. How can we uh, just oppose this? Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa Which one will reign supreme? The etiquette of Islam or the tradition of the US? I want you to answer me. <laughs> you, uh, I, I surrender, sir, inshallah. I surrender. <laughs> the etiquette of Islam should reign supreme, irrespective of what operates in our environment. So that is Islam for you. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah wa barakatuh. And another question that I have here is when uh, you are praying and you, your parent called you, what are the best signs? Are you supposed to clap your hand to tell your parent you are praying or, or anybody generally? What are the best signs to, to make uh, based on the Quran or this Islam? Uh, I have talked about that. When you talk about praying, you look at it from two perspectives. If it is the compulsory solat, you are not allowed to terminate your solat because your dad or your mom calls on you. You only make a sign to let them know that you are observing solat. You understand me now? So if it is a male, he says, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. If it were to be a female, she will clap the hands. So as a sign. But if it is nerfing, it is not a compulsory solat. So by the time the dad or the mom calls on somebody, maybe at the first instance, you do not answer them because you are busy in your solat. But he or she continues to repeat the call. There's no need you making a sign. You are allowed, you can terminate your solat and go and respond. Or if you understand that it's not something very serious, you can still make sign. If she or she understands, but despite that, if you have made the sign and they do not understand, you are allowed to terminate the solat. But there's a difference between the compulsory solat and the nothing, inshallah. Uh, yeah, the another uh, question that I have here, but it's is an observation also. When you are giving the lecture, you talk about the. A uh, child should be should be kind to his uh, to his or her parent, and uh, uh, to the to the extent that the parents will be will be so 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 pleased with that child, even if the parent is non-Muslim. And uh, are we saying that when a non-Muslim parent died, we don't have any obligatory thing as a Muslim that is supposed to offer? Well, Alhamdulillah, of the If by chance one's parents, either the dad or the mom, is not a Muslim. Then the first assignment you have to do is, even before he or she passes on, that child should try to work on his parents so that he or she accepts Islam. That is the first assignment you have. You do da'wah. You invite them to Islam. So if you have been successful in your da'wah and they accept Islam, in fact, it is a great achievement in the life of that child. But if otherwise, all efforts to make dawah, they refuse to accept Islam, then you will do good to them with all the resources at your disposal when they are alive. Immediately they pass on, that is the end. Don't have anything, any good you have to do to them. No hajj, no umrah, no prayer, nothing. 
except for the as other aspect of being good to members of their family or their friends. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ah, uh, well, I, I have exhausted all the questions I have here. Uh, give me one second. If anyone still have any question, you should send or you should signify it by raising up your hand or you should send your question to the board. Hold on, sir. Assalamu alaikum alam Yusuf. There are some questions in the chat. Okay. okay. If, you, if you don't see that, I can quickly read them for the Sheikh. Okay, bismillah. Okay, Sheikh, Jazakallah khairan for the beautiful tafsir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you abundantly. We really enjoy your tafsir. Jazakallah khairan. So, um, the, the question I have here says, are children obligated to cater for their parents when they themselves were abandoned or disowned when growing up? Yes, I had initially mentioned it in my lecture that children are obligated to cater for their parents even if by chance they were abandoned by those parents. The fact that they've been abandoned by their parents is not a yardstick for them to now reciprocate to them based on what they have done for them. So that is Islam for them. They have been found wanting in their own responsibilities. So two evils cannot make a right. So since they've been found wanting, that child should not use that as a yardstick to now abandon his own parents. He should do good for them and leave the parents with Allah for having abandoned the child. So that is the stand of Islam. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. So an extension of that question, if you can just use a few seconds to also explain that, is we are now in Ramadan. We are now in Ramadan. It is not impossible that we have some, some of our parents, they themselves are disobeying Allah in this month of Ramadan. They are not fasting without any just cause. They are not praying without any just reason. So, and, and they do have some children that are very pious, very religious. So, is it going to be a sin on such children when they themselves disobey their parents because their parents are sent not to obey Allah? The, the, the children should not disobey the parents because the parents are disobeying Allah. You understand? But what I've said is, if the parents are doing something wrong, the first responsibility of the child is to make dawah, is to discourage the parents. Look at the Quran now. Look at Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Look at in Surah Al Anbiya, the way the interaction between Ibrahim and his dad. Ibrahim's father was an idol worshiper. He disobeys Allah. But look at the way Ibrahim did dawah. Despite all this effort of Ibrahim, his father refused. He did not accept Islam. If not accept the message of the truth. But Ibrahim, if you should look at his presentation, he was not hard. He was not hard. It reached a state that the dad threatened Ibrahim. I shall stone you. And I implore people to stone you, you this Ibrahim. You are too troublesome. This your dawah is becoming very harsh on me. So, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if our parents disobey Allah, that is not a yardstick for us to disobey them in things that are good. Don't forget, in things that are good, in things that are allowed. But when it comes to disobeying them with respect to that particular act of disobedience, then totally we should not obey them. Because I've clarified this. The prophet has said, La ta'atu li fi Let me give you an example. If someone's dad is someone that takes alcohol, so he does not even know the difference between the month of Ramadan or outside Ramadan. Now we have listened to the lecture of obeying parents, doing good to the parents. He now the, the parent now calls his child to come and go and buy the stock of that particular kind of alcohol that he takes. So one should not obey them in this context. So disobeying them in that context will not be tantamount to sin in the side of that particular kind of child. But in things that are good, they are, they are disobeying Allah, but they give us some command with respect to some things that has to do with our day-in-day-out activities that do not have any crime when you obey them. 
you are still allowed to obey them inshallah salam alaikum wa alaikum salam jazakallah because of time uh, sorry bro you uh, i just want us to maximize the opportunity that we have to share there should be another program coming up now but i will just take these few questions together and i would just want you to because they're kind of related so i'm i'm going to ask I'll, i'll be asking you two questions now one of yeah. so they are this So are children supposed to okay sorry uh, what is the obligation of a dad when the child moves away from Islam after maturity what is the obligation of a dad when the child abandons Islam after maturity and something related to that is what if my parent a, a daughter is now asking what if my parent doesn't want me to wear a hijab should I obey him okay alhamdulillah rabbil alamin the obligation of a dad when his child moves out of islam is synonymous to the obligation of the child when the parent moves out of islam so the obligation of a dad when a child moves out of islam is to try all possible efforts to bring that child back to islam even if he can go to the extent of by cutting the child or if there's a way of punishing the child that is when all these actions will bring a positive result if these actions do not bring a positive result then the parents the dad should think otherwise but the dad should insist in his words in his action to show to the child that he is not pleased with the party the child has chosen for himself then secondly if a sister wears hijab and the dad this allows this she should not obey him is still under that particular hadith that says do not obey the creator of allah to disobey allah who is the creator so she should not obey him so she does not have any crime in disobeying her dad with respect to instruction of allah salam alaykum Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh we start uh we thank you so much for for your time. Uh we appreciate all the response based on the uh the question. I know we have we still have more questions to be to ask but there is no time for us because we need to prepare for other program which is coming up right now. Uh we appreciate you sir. Uh inshallah we we'll see you next week. Uh may Allah ta la be with you and your family. Jazakumullah wa khairan shaykh. Jazakumullah wa khairan kaseer. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Uh now I will move straight to the uh brother Shakur 